In this video, I'm going to cover crystal field theory. So when bonds form in coordination compounds, we call them coordination bonds because the ligand donates both electrons to the bond and the coordinating metal doesn't donate any electrons to the bond. So these bonds um, are formed because the electrons on the ligand are attracted to the positively charged metal cation. Uh, however, the metal cation, even though it's positively charged, meaning that it's missing some of its electrons, it still has lots of electrons on it. And a lot of those electrons are typically still in d orbitals. So uh, although the metal cation is charged, um, it still has enough electrons to repel the electrons from the ligand. The ligands bring their electrons in to make these coordination bonds. There's already electrons in the metal ion, and the two electrons repel each other. And this repulsion uh, causes the energies of the d orbitals to split. So we've already kind of seen this before um, when we were looking at electron configurations and orbitals of uh, atomic orbitals um, back in an earlier chapter. So remember in a hydrogen atom that consists of a proton and one electron, um, there's only one electron in a hydrogen atom. And so uh, sometimes we assume there's only one orbital, the 1s orbital. But even though uh, the hydrogen atom only has one electron, all of the orbitals um, are still, they still exist around that hydrogen atom. So we have 1s, 2s, we have 2p orbitals, and then 3s, and 3p orbitals, and then we have the d orbitals, and so on and so on. So even though there aren't any electrons in those orbitals on a hydrogen atom, they still exist as places for the electron to go. And so what we mean by that is that when we look at an orbital diagram for hydrogen, and I put all of the orbitals, which are, remember, just places that the electrons can go, and it goes 1s, and then it goes 2s, and then it goes 2p, and then it goes 3s, and 3p, and 3d. So in hydrogen, I only have one electron here. And if I excite that electron, it could go into the second shell. And if it goes into the second shell, it can either go into a 2s or a 2p orbital. And it doesn't matter which one it goes into because they're all the same energy in hydrogen. There are no elect there are, this is the only electron. So if I give it enough energy to go into the second shell, it could go into any of these degenerate orbitals. If I give the electron and hydrogen enough energy to go to the third shell, it could go to any of these orbitals that are in the third shell. They're all degenerate. They're all of the same energy. So in hydrogen, being that it only has one electron, all of the different uh, subshells within a shell, s, p, d, and so on, they're all at equivalent energy. But remember that this isn't the way that we're used to seeing this orbital diagram. We're used to seeing it like this, where it goes 1s, 2s, 2p, slightly higher, right? And then 3s, and then 3p is higher than that, and then 3d is even higher than that. So remember, this is, this is uh, for most, uh, well, let's say all orbitals, all elements, beyond, sorry, my pen isn't working quite right, beyond hydrogen. All elements beyond hydrogen. This is for hydrogen. So what's the difference? Why, do the, why are the orbitals, why do the orbital energies split? In hydrogen, they're all equal. And then in other elements, 3s and 3p and 3d are not equal. There are different energies. Well, the reason is because in other elements, I have more electrons down here, right? We have this situation where by the time I get to the 3s uh, shell, I already have electrons in 1s and 2s. And so if I have a positive nucleus and there's a full shell of electrons, 
and the second shell is full and there's eight electrons in the second shell four six eight electrons in the second shell and by the time we get to the third shell the third shell contains 3s 3p and 3d by the time we get to this third shell there's already so many electrons underneath that those electrons underneath are changing the energy of these orbitals the ones that can get closest to the nucleus their energy is changed the least those are the s orbitals they have the most penetration and the ones that have the least penetration they, that are the furthest away from the nucleus the d orbitals they are shifted up in energy the most so orbitals split energy because electrons are already there underneath and the electrons in shell 2 repel the electrons in shell 3 and that repulsion causes the energy levels to split. So this is the same kind of thing that's happening when we talk about the energy levels, the d energy levels splitting when more electrons come in. When the ligand brings electrons to the metal, it's adding electrons to a system that already has electrons. And so that splits the energy of the, of the orbitals. The difference in energy depends on the complex formed. Um, so which kind of ion we're looking at, it depends on the kinds of ligands, um, and it depends on uh, the geometry. So remember, this is the geometry of d orbitals. d orbitals, it goes 1s, 2s, 2p, 3s, 3p, 4s, and then 3d, right? So we've got 3d here. Um, and so the 3d orbitals here uh, are shifted even higher in energy than the 4s. Remember that so this is why this is also why the 3d orbitals are higher in energy than 4s is because of that uh, repulsion causes 3d to even go above the 4s orbital. So here's the electron configuration of chromium. It has all of these up to 3p. We call that argon, right? So all of these full orbitals here. That's the electron configuration of argon. So we just use the shortcut. And then beyond argon, we have 3d5. 4s1. So this is the orbital diagram and the electron configuration for chromium. And these, or, these electrons that are in d orbitals, one of them is in this orbital, 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 and one of them is in this orbital. Right? Because there's five electrons and there are five different geometries of the orbitals. Now see, let's look at how these orbitals are different. So this one right here, it lies on the z axis and on the y-axis. So this is the, a plane. When we look at two axes, z and y, for example, they create a flat surface. Right? We extend this flat surface out from z and y, and this flat surface is called a plane. And so the z-y plane, that's where these orbitals are lying in the z-y plane. And they're, the orbitals are actually in between the z and the y-axis. Look, this orbital goes 45 degrees in between z and y and this one goes 45 degrees in between z and y down here in this quadrant and 45 this way and 45 this way this orbital is lying on the z x plane you see that and again the the orbitals themselves are not lying on the axes this orbital is in between z and x 45 degrees this one is in between z and x 45 degrees and so on and we have this one here which is on the x y plane. So I take the x-axis and the y-axis and that makes a flat surface. That blue flat surface is a plane and these orbitals lie within that x-y plane and again they're not on the axes. They're, they're 45 degrees in between the x and y axes. This one down here is in the same plane, right? This one's in the x-y plane. This one's also in the x-y plane. Uh, but this one that's in the x-y plane the orbitals lie directly on the axis, right? In this one, there aren't any orbitals on x. There aren't any orbitals on y. In this one, there are orbitals on x, and there are orbitals on y. So this one's called dxy in the xy plane. This one's called dx squared minus y squared. So in this one, the orbitals are offset from the axes, and in this one, the orbitals are right on the axes. And this one, is totally different. It has a totally different shape. It has these two uh, uh, lobes, right? And these lobes are directly on the z-axis. But then instead of having another set of two other lobes, it has this circular shape, like a donut. 
and the donut goes right around the axis and it's kind of lying in the XY plane. So we've got lobes on the Z axis and then a donut in the XY plane circling the, uh, the nucleus. So these are the shapes of all the D orbitals. So a metal ion in the middle of a coordination complex like chromium that has electrons in D orbitals, this is where those electrons lie. They're lying in shapes like this. When uh, a, an ion, a, um, a coordination complex is formed and a transition metal is going to uh, coordinate with ligands, remember that it takes on a specific geometry. If there's two ligands, we say the geometry is linear. If there's four ligands, the geometry can be tetrahedral or square planar. And if there's six ligands, the geometry of the complex is octahedral. So the electrons that are being brought by the ligands, they have the shape. This is the shape of the electrons that are on the metal ion. This is the shape of the electrons that are being brought in by the ligands. The, the ligands would be right here, L. L, or here, L, 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 right? And the ligand is bringing these in, and this right here is the metal ion in the middle, and the metal ion in the middle has electrons in D orbitals, right? So we would draw these D orbitals over this and say, okay, those are the ligands there. Well, I've also got D orbitals on this metal ion that kind of look like this. I've got a set that looks like this. I've got a set that looks like this. I've got a set it looks like this with the, the donut in the middle, right? So all of these, all of these donut, all of, all of these D orbital shapes are in the middle and the ligands are bringing in electrons in these shapes, linear, tetrahedral, square planar, and octahedral. Yeah. So um, we're going to look at how Depending on the geometry of the complex, whether it's linear or tetrahedral or square planar or octahedral, how the electrons that the ligands are bringing in, how they're going to interfere with the electrons that are already there. Right? So we have to analyze these shapes against these shapes. So let's do octahedral first. So you can see that inside this uh, octahedron, what this is inside the octahedron you can see the d orbitals here's my uh, z squared where there's an, an or uh, lobes on the z axis in a donut here's my x squared minus y squared where there's lobes right on the x and y axes and so on and so on and so on all these d orbitals that we looked at and uh octahedral is easy to think about first because here's the shape of octahedral and where are the electrons in an octahedral complex? Well, they are directly on the axes, right? If we call this the z-axis, and this is y, and this is x, then in an octahedral complex, the, elect the uh, um, lobes are directly on these, um, directly on uh, the axes. So the one the uh, we see here, this d orbital has lobes that are directly on Z, right? Well, in an octahedral complex, we also have lobes that are directly on Z. Uh, we see this one right here, this D orbital has lobes that are directly on Y and directly on X. Well, here in my octahedral complex, I have lobes that are directly on Y and directly on X. So the point is, it's, it's hard to kind of see this, but this is an octahedral. These minuses right here that I'm circling, those are the minuses that are coming in from the ligands. Those are the electrons that the ligand is donating. And so here are the electrons that are inside the d orbital already. And here are the electrons that the uh, ligand is bringing in, that the ligand is donating. This and this are repelling right here. Can you see that interaction? So right here and right here, there's repulsion between this electron that the ligand is bringing in on this lobe of the octahedral complex, right? There'd be six ligands. This ligand down here is bringing in electrons, and those electrons that it's bringing in are bumping up against the electrons that are already on the metal atom inside this d orbital, and it causes this repulsion. Same as happening up here. I've got 
an electron in a d orbital, electrons from the ligand that are coming in, and they're directly bumping up against the ones already there. Electron, electron, that's repulsion. In this specific orbital, these electrons don't bump up against anything. These don't bump up. These don't bump up. These don't bump up. So those um, electrons aren't doing anything. But this one here and this one here, they're repelling electrons that are already there. And we can do the same thing here, right? We'll draw these, the same uh, octahedron complex where essentially what I'm doing is taking this purple ball and I'm trying to draw, draw it over here, although my drawing isn't nearly as good. But one on top. Right, the ligand on top. My pen is stuck. There we go. The ligand on bottom. The one that pops out. This one that pops out. And this one that goes back behind. And this one that goes back behind. All right, so here's my octahedral, the ligands, the electrons that the ligands are bringing in in this shape. And here they're bouncing up, they're, they're directly interfering with there is repulsion, there is repulsion, there is repulsion, and there is repulsion. Right, so we can show repulsion here, repulsion, repulsion, repulsion. So when we enter, when we try to uh, overlay the octahedral geometry on top of the d orbital geometry we see that certain orbitals have electrons in exactly the same place as the electrons that are being brought in by the ligands when we do that down here with this set of orbitals we'll see that something different is happening so i'll just kind of draw my orbitals again this one comes out front this one comes out front this one goes back behind this one goes back behind so here you can see that, uh, of course, my drawing might have made it even more difficult to see, not easier. But the electrons here, let me get rid of this for a second. So the electrons are from the octahedral uh, ligands are still being brought in on, at the same exact place. So I draw these blue circles around all the electrons. The blue circles or the blue lobes are always in the same place for all five of these. So drawing them might make this drawing look more crowded than it needs to right now. So you can see that these orbitals in this these d orbitals are not lying on the axis. These are the orbitals that are in between the axes, right? Well, all of the lobes of the octahedral complex are always right on the axis. So these electrons are coming in right on the axis, but this electron and this electron are 45 degrees away from the axis. So this and this are not repelling this, right? And this one that's pointing in between the axes, and this one back here that's pointing in between these axes, that's not repelling this one because they're not right on the axis, they're pointing away from each other, right? And there's nothing on the z-axis, so there's nothing to repel this one and this one. So this particular d orbital does not experience any repulsion in an octahedral complex. Same here. This one, the orbitals are pointing in between the axes. All the electrons donated by the ligands in an octahedral complex come in directly on the axis, and so there is no repulsion. They don't bump up against each other. That happens here and here and here. We have no repulsion because, remember, those orbitals are in between the axes. But here I have an orbital directly on Z. That interferes with the octahedral ligands. Here I have orbitals directly on X and Y that interferes with the octahedral ligands. So what that does is when I have electrons in this orbital or this orbital, they are higher in energy than the electrons that are in this orbital, this orbital, and this orbital. So what we've done is we've taken our Z, or excuse me, we've taken our D electrons, we've taken the D electrons that are uh, generally all at the same energy in chromium, right? We said that chromium, of course, chromium is not going to bond as a, as a neutral metal. It's not going to have five electrons when it's in a coordination complex. But let's just assume for a minute that it did, that this was chromium. It had five single electrons. Um, when it has five single electrons like this, and they're all at the same energy when I'm talking about a chromium atom, 
But when I'm talking about a coordination complex, these two orbitals, these are the ones that are interfering with the octahedral ligands, these are the ones that go up in energy. And these three do not interfere with the octahedral ligands, so they don't go up in energy at least as much. Bringing electrons into the system does cause some repulsion, even though they're not bumping right up against each other, they are repelling a little. So you see that there are, there's a little bit of a difference here. But the ones that are directly on the z-axis or the x and y-axis are directly interfering with those ligands, and so those electrons go up in energy even more. So now, what was five electrons that are all of the same energy, now it's one, two, three electrons that are at a low energy, and two electrons that are at a higher energy. So the, electron, the energy of those electrons in the d orbital gets split. And we call that energy, this, this gap here, the crystal field splitting energy, delta, um, depends on the kinds of ligands and what the geometry of the complex is, like we just saw. So this affects why, um, why uh, transition metals have colored solutions, and uh, sometimes the metals themselves are colored, although that's not due to crystal field splitting. Um, but when we look at uh, transition metals, we often see that um, solutions of copper, for example, are blue or green. Um, solutions of chromium are purple, uh, but solutions of, of main group metals, like potassium and rubidium and uh, sodium, all of those metals are colorless. All of those salts are white, but salts of transition metals are colored. And so the reason that salts of transition metals are colored is because of this crystal field uh, splitting energy. So um, remember that what causes uh, visible light to be absorbed by a material which, which changes its color is due to differences in energy in the orbitals where the electrons can go. So when the electrons go from a, a lower energy state to a higher energy state, then that can absorb, that can be enough energy, that gap in between the, the orbitals can match the amount of energy in visible light, and so it can absorb visible light, which excites the electron, which changes the color of the solution, of the material that we're looking at. So uh, remember, this is kind of what's happening. We have a material here. Here's my solution. And I have white light shining on it, right? So we've got, remember, white light is the whole rainbow. So I don't have the whole rainbow, but I'll do my best here. I've got blue and red and green and yellow. So, and we call this white, right? Even though it doesn't actually contain all the colors of the rainbow here, imagine that it does. White light shining on a sample, and if on the other side, the red light is missing, then I have uh, the that makes this sample look a different color. So white light comes in, the red light gets absorbed by the sample, and so what comes out is all of the colors of the rainbow minus red, minus the one that got absorbed. So what we have here is white minus red, because red was absorbed by this material, because the, the energy in red light, 750 for example, matched the energy, the gap between the electron orbitals, and so that was enough energy to absorb a red photon to excite that electron, and so the, the light that comes out the other side is missing red. And so what color is this solution? Well, when a color is absorbed, we look at the color wheel here, we have Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, Violet, Roy G. Biv. So when red is absorbed, then a, a substance is going to appear to be the complementary color of the one that is absorbed. So let's start with red. 
if red is absorbed, if a red photon is absorbed, like what we're showing down here, then the color of that solution is going to appear to be green. So white minus red equals green. Green is one of the components that's left because if we imagine that white light has all of these, and when I remove red, then what I have is orange plus yellow plus green plus blue plus violet. So orange plus yellow plus green plus blue plus violet is green for the most part, right? So we've got this one here, these two, and these two kind of balance each other out. And so this one doesn't have anything on this side to balance it out because the red was absorbed. And so the solution appears green. So this is how solutions appear to be certain colors. And so when we look at uh, a situation like this, 3D, here's a metal um, that has three electrons in the 3D orbital, and it's going to make a coordination complex. When it makes a coordination complex, those 3D electrons are going to be split right? because of what we just talked about, that repulsion of electrons. And so what that's going to do is now I've got 3D electrons down here, and I've got two open orbitals up here. So if a photon, right, H nu, a photon of some energy, we're, we're, talking, we're saying it's red, right? So 750 nanometers a red photon comes in, then that's enough energy to excite one of these electrons. Right? The electron will go up into another orbital. Change my color here so I can write in the black. And I'll have one, two electrons down here, and one electron up here now, right? Because this one, the photon comes in, that has an energy of 750 nanometers, which is exactly the same as this energy right here, this gap right here. And when this photon hits this electron, it gives it enough energy to go up to this next energy uh, level, this next orbital. And so that removes the red and that causes the solution to look green. So this exciting the electron into this upper orbital. So this is why transition compounds are colored because splitting the d orbitals like this creates an energy gap then that energy gap is generally about the same size as visible light and so visible light can cause electrons to be excited into these upper orbitals uh, which removes it from the white spectrum which causes the substance to look like it has a color The color of complex ions are due to electronic transitions between the split D sublevel orbitals, and the wavelength of maximum absorbance can be used to determine the size of the energy gap between the split D sublevel uh, sub orbitals. So again, what we were just showing is that if we know uh, what the color of the solution is, then we can determine what the energy of the photon is that was absorbed. And if we know what the energy of the photon is that was absorbed, then we know what the gap is between those orbitals. How much were the d orbitals split? Well, the color of the solution tells us how much they were split because the color of the solution is an indication of what energy photon is being absorbed, which is an indication of how big that splitting energy is. The size of the energy gap depends on what kind of ligands are attached. So certain ligands will make that delta bigger, and certain ligands will make it smaller. The, one, the ligands that will make it bigger are called strong field ligands. And strong field ligands are things like cyanide, which is the strongest, and we have nit nitrite, NO2-, minus, ethylene diamine, and ammonia. These are among the strong field ligands. And among the weak field ligands, we have H2O, which is the, the strongest of the weak field ligands, but it's still considered weak, all the way down to I-, minus, the weakest of the weak field ligands. So this would cause the least amount of splitting, delta would be the smallest, and this would cause the most amount of splitting, delta would be the biggest. So remember, the lowest amount of splitting means that this, uh, if this were going to absorb a photon of visible light, it would absorb a photon of the lowest energy, and the lowest energy is red.
So things that have the weakest splitting would absorb red and would likely appear green, right? But here, this would absorb the highest energy light because the gap would be the biggest, and so these might absorb purple light or violet light, which is the highest energy at about 400 nanometers, so these might appear yellow. So these down here might appear green because they absorb red light, and these up here might appear yellow because they absorb purple light or very high energy light. The splitting is very large. Um, and the size of the energy gap also depends on the type of cation. So the gap gets bigger as the charge on the metal cation increases. So if we have um, Fe3 plus versus Fe2 plus, they're the same metal, but 3 plus has a bigger splitting than 2 plus uh, because it draws those electrons from the ligands in even closer. And as they get even closer, they cause even more repulsion with the electrons that are already there. So because of this crystal field splitting, the electrons that might have been paired when before the d orbitals were split might become unpaired after the d orbitals are split, depending on the size of that gap. If the gap is really small, the electrons can go up to the top orbitals. If the gap is really big, then those electrons are stuck down below. So that changes the pairing of these electrons. Um, and remember, when we have lots of unpaired electrons, then we call that uh, paramagnetic. And when we have lots of paired electrons, we call that diamagnetic. And when things that are um, diamagnetic have paired electrons, that means that they are not attracted to a, a magnetic field. So in order for compounds to be attracted to a, uh, a magnetic field, they have to have unpaired electrons. And then their unpaired electrons can align with that magnetic field, with an external magnetic field. So because the splitting in the d orbital changes the pairing of electrons, ones that were paired might now not be paired, and ones that were not paired might now be paired, that changes the magnetic properties of some of these uh, coordination compounds. So um, the fourth and fifth electrons generally will go into those upper orbitals if the field is weak and if the energy gap is small. Um, but if the gap is big, then they'll be stuck down below and that will change the pairing. So here's an example. With this coordination compound, I have six cyanide ligands. That six, that six should go on the outside of the parentheses, not the inside. Um, and each cyanide is a minus one. So if I have six of them and they're all minus one, then that gives me a negative charge of minus six. If the overall charge on the iron or on the complex is minus four, then that means iron must be plus two. So iron is in a plus two oxidation state here. And in a plus two oxidation state, iron is going to have six electrons in d orbitals. So when this gap is really large, and it's large because remember cyanide is the strongest strong field ligand, and so when, when a compound is paired with cyanide, delta, this gap is very big. And if this gap is very big, the electrons are stuck down here. The electrons don't have enough energy to get up here into these upper orbitals. So those six electrons get one, two, three, four, five, six. They get completely paired up. So this compound is diamagnetic. It doesn't have any unpaired electrons. It would not interact with an external magnetic field because it doesn't have any single electrons to line up with that field. And we call this a low spin complex. Remember, spin is either up or down. And when they're all paired like this, when all the spins are paired, I don't have any unpaired spins, then we call that a low spin complex. There is no spin. All the spins cancel out. Up and down are all paired. They all cancel out. In this side, it's the same ion, iron 2 plus. Now we're looking at water as a ligand. Water is a weak field ligand, and it's neutral. So having six of them doesn't affect the charge of the complex because it's neutral. Therefore, if the complex has a plus two charge, then iron must be in the two plus oxidation state. So water being a weak field ligand means that this gap is going to be small. Now, of course, looking at the picture, they look like they're exactly the same size. But imagine that this is a really big gap here, and that this is a really small gap here. If the gap is large, like we just said, the electrons are stuck. But if the gap is small enough, then the electrons can get up there. So then when we do the Aufbau principle, we're going to fill these up and pretend like there's no gap at all. So it would go 1, 2, 3, 4, 
five, they all go in one at a time first, and if I have any left over, six, they start pairing up. So um, the actually, you know what? I'm gonna take that back. I wanna do that differently. They're gonna go in like this because this gap, even though it's a small gap, it's still a gap that's gonna cause the electrons to wanna go down here first. So it'll go one, two, three, and then the next ones will go up here, four, five, and then we'll fill this one up, six, and if we had another, it would go seven, eight, and then we'd finally go up here, nine, ten, and those would be the last ones to fill in. So right now, um, in a, in a, when this gap is large, all of the electrons are paired, and therefore, this is a diamagnetic complex. But when this gap is small, I now suddenly have four unpaired electrons. And un, four unpaired electrons makes this compound paramagnetic. It has high spin because these are all pointing up, so that spin is not balanced. And this is now very magnetic. It is very reactive in a magnetic field. So based on the uh, ligand, that would change the color of this complex because it changes delta. And it also changes the magnetic properties of this complex because it changes how the electrons fit into the uh, into the orbitals. So only electron configurations D4, D5, D6, or D7 can have low or high spin. If something is D3, it's always high spin because it goes 1, 2, 3, and they're always unpaired. If something is D2, same, 1, 2, unpaired. D1 is always unpaired. So D1, D2, and D3 are always unpaired. And D8, D9, and D10 are always paired, regardless of where they go, right? Because we'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then we'd have 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So after D8 and so on, we would only have those two electrons up here, but then we don't have any uh, gap. We don't have any... Um, uh, any electron, there's not an open uh, orbital up here for an electron to jump into. Okay, so this, that was for octahedral complexes. So let's look at the situation for tetrahedral complexes. So we're, this is the same kind of idea here. We're looking at uh, where the electrons are in a tetrahedral complex. And remember, in a tetrahedral complex, the electrons are kind of like this. One here. One's kind of like this. One's kind of like this. And one's kind of like this. Right? So it's this tetrahedron where these four lobes here of uh, that are 109.5 degrees apart. So we can see that in a tetrahedral complex, the ligands are going to come in uh, at this angle, and the way that that's going to interfere with okay, so. Uh, this is the same kind of idea that we just looked at with the octahedral complex, but now we'll look at tetrahedral. So here are the orbitals in a tetrahedral complex. I've got one that's pointing this way, one that's pointing down here, one that's pointing up here to this corner, and then one that's pointing down here to this corner, right? Okay, so there are my, my uh, orbitals in a tetrahedral shape. In this tetrahedral shape, then we have to imagine what the d orbitals are doing, right? So I've got a set of d orbitals where there's one that's sitting on the z axis, right? That z squared, and it kind of goes like this, and down here like this, and then there's kind of a donut in the middle, right? So this is the same kind of idea. Now we're looking at the blue orbitals, which are now in a tetrahedral arrangement, not an octahedral arrangement. And in what way do the tetrahedral orbitals interfere with the d orbitals? Well, how do the blue ones interfere with the red ones? Well, after if we did the same kind of analysis, what we would see is that it flips it. Now, the two that were high energy in the octahedral complex are now low energy in the tetrahedral complex. We can see that right here. Z squared does not interfere with those orbitals at all because none of these tetrahedral orbitals are on the z-axis. 
then I've got another one that x squared or x squared minus y squared where all of these orbitals are sitting right on these axes right on the x and y axes and those also have no interference because these blue orbitals are pointing aren't pointing directly at the axis so these ones that are kind of in the middle of the axes as you might imagine they're interfering with all of the d orbitals that are in the middle of the axis so remember oops go back here and look at these d orbitals again this one this one and this one these are all in the middle of the axis so this one this one and this one these are the ones that are that interfere with the tetrahedral ligands these ones don't interfere with the tetrahedral ligands so we kind of have the same here's octahedral z squared x squared minus y squared are the high energy and here's tetrahedral z squared minus uh, z squared and x squared minus y squared are the low energy. It's flipped. So that's going to cause different uh, splitting patterns. And as we fill in the electrons to see the splitting, it's going to be different depending on this because of this different geometry. And finally, if we look at square planar compounds and we do the same kind of analysis, so we're just right, we're just changing. The geometry of the ligands every time. So now I've got a ligand on Y, ligand on X. So these uh, are not going to be, uh, when I have a square planar compound like this and the ligands are kind of coming in like this on all of the X and Y axes, then we you can imagine that the orbital that might be the highest energy, the one that would experience <coughs> You can imagine that with the ligands coming in directly on the X and Y axes like this, that the orbital that would see feel the most repulsion is the orbital that has exactly the same geometry. There is an orbital that looks exactly like this. The d orbital called x squared minus y squared has exactly the same shape, that it lies directly on x and directly on y. So that pushes the uh, energy of that orbital very high. Um, xy is the one where the orbitals are in between the x and y uh, axes so that is also going to interfere with this one somewhat z squared is the one where it's on top and down below and there's that donut so the donut is going to interfere with these a bit and finally xz and yz the ones where the orbitals are in between the x and uh, x and z axes or y and z axes those will interfere with this pattern the least so the splitting pattern what's going to happen to the d orbitals depends on the geometry So this is what an octahedral splitting looks like. Two on top, three on bottom. This is what tetrahedral looks like. Three on top, two on bottom, it gets flipped. And this is what square planar looks like. One on the very top, and then another one, and then another one out there. Those three are split to a different extent. So this square planar pattern is the most complex splitting pattern. We don't just have two different sets. Now we have four different sets. They're, they've been split into four different groups. Um, and again, remember, square planar geometry only happens with D8 metals. So like platinum 2+, plus, palladium 2+, plus, iridium+, plus, gold 3+. Plus. This is fairly rare to have a square planar geometry. Um, and generally, these are almost all low spin complexes meaning that the electrons are generally paired and that's because I can have two unpaired electrons here one two the next one would go we go one two and the next one would go three so and then four and that would kinda that those are then paired up and then I'd have one here and the next one can't get up to that higher level so it would go here and then I'd have one here and here and here and here there's no way for me to get a situation where I have this.
where I have five unpaired electrons. Because this one up here is at far too high of an energy to go in there by itself. It's going to go in one, two, and then the next one's not going to go up here. The next one's going to pair up with these because of that energy gap, and then so on. It's going to go like this. So that means that generally the electrons in these complexes are almost always paired. And if they're almost always paired, then they're almost all low spin complexes. Okay, so what, what are some applications of coordination compounds? So uh, because coordination compounds can kind of grab onto a metal, we talked about this earlier with chelation, they can be helpful in the extraction of metals from ores. So silver and gold are very, very difficult to dissolve. Uh, they generally do, most metals will dissolve in nitric acid, but silver and gold will not dissolve in nitric acid. So it's generally difficult to ex extract silver and gold from ore because a way to extract ore is to use nitric acid. So because that strong acid won't work for gold, we have to use different methods. And so since gold is not very soluble, if we can form a complex with gold using cyanide ligands, then we can increase the solubility of gold. And we saw this in the solubility chapter two that if we compare insoluble compounds that have a very small KSP with a uh, KF, the formation constant of a complex ion that's very favorable, then we can increase the solubility of that compound. So that's kind of a, a way that we can use these complex ions to extract metals from ores. Um, we can also use them as chelating agents to trap metals. So if you are poisoned, lead poisoning, mercury poisoning, um, sometimes you're given EDTA, that uh, hexadentate ligand that has six places to grab onto a metal, because the, this EDTA can grab onto the lead and kind of shield it from the rest of your system. So it's not lead anymore in your system. It's EDTA bonded lead. The, the EDTA is kind of covering the lead, so the lead cannot disrupt your system in the same way that it might otherwise do. Um, and because of the color change, we can use the color change to give us some indication of what's happening in the chemistry. So the changing color of coordination compounds helps us to understand what ligands are attached and whether it's strong field or weak field, um, help us to identify whether we have certain compounds in a solution. Um, because if I add a certain ligand, it might turn blue if cobalt is around, or it might turn red if iron is around. So we can use these ligands to determine what is in our solution. Um, these uh, coordination compounds are also found extensively in biomolecules. So these uh, trace metals are really important for uh, Bi biological functions in the human body. Chromium, manganese, molybdenum, iron, copper, zinc. So you might not think of copper as being an essential nutrient or at least a, a microvitamin, but we need to have some small amount of copper, some small amount of chromium. These are important for, uh, for the functioning of some biomolecules. So here's an example. This is called a porphyrin ring. And a porphyrin ring is composed almost entirely of carbon and hydrogen with a couple of nitrogen. These blue ones are nitrogen. Everything else is carbon and hydrogen. Um, in this porphyrin ring, if we put an iron in there, then we call it heme. And that's how uh, this, uh, this protein, hemoglobin, can transport oxygen. The oxygen can bond to the iron that's in this heme complex. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, here's that porphyrin again. Uh, porphyrin with uh, magnesium in the middle can be used for is a component of chlorophyll. So this you can see this is a square planar complex with nitrogen atoms being the ligands and the iron is kind of in the middle being a coordinating ion. Here's magnesium being in the middle the co this coordinating ion and this is a chlorophyll molecule with that same porphyrin ring structure. Um, a really important enzyme called carbonic anhydrase uh, catalyzes the reaction between water and CO2, and this is tetrahedrally complex zinc. So there's a zinc ion in there, 
and it has tetrahedral geometry and some of the ligands there um, that's what gives this molecule this big protein its shape is that these ligands point at that zinc and it kind of locks it in place and it gives it this very specific structure and when it has this very specific structure it can do its very specific job so metal ions transition metal ions are very important in these biomolecules to help uh, very complicated complex molecules take on very specific shapes here's another example of uh, uh, anti-cancer drug cisplatin which is a square planar complex with platinum some chlorine atoms and some uh, NH3 some ammonia ligands so um, these uh, coordination complexes are found often in nature.